a lot of this work was pursued during COVID isolation uh, alone in my bedroom, and it's really exciting to now be sharing it uh, in front of a lot of people in, in, in person. So uh, the title of this work is Attention Approximates Force Distributed Memory. Uh, it was done by myself in collaboration with Genghis Palavan, uh, and I'm now advised by uh, Dr. Creeman. Um, and let's get into it. So first of all, why should you care? Uh, we show that the heuristic attention operation can be implemented with simple properties of high dimensional vectors in a biologically plausible fashion. Uh, the transformer and its attention operation are incredibly powerful, but were heuristically developed. And the softmax operation in attention is particularly important, but also heuristic. Uh, now the intersection of hyperspheres that's used in sparse distributed memory closely approximates the softmax and attention operation, both in theory and trained transformer models that we investigate. So SDM thus preempted attention by approximately 30 years, having been made back in 1988, uh, and meets a high bar for biological plausibility, uh, particularly it maps compellingly to the unique wiring of the cerebellum. So as an overview of this presentation, I'm first gonna give a summary of sparse distributed memory, and then I'm gonna give a summary of transformer attention. Uh, I'll then show the relationship um, and how SDM can also interpret the transformer more broadly. And then if there's time, which there probably won't be, uh, I wanna give a review of SDM's biological plausibility in the cerebellum, so we'll see how we do. I'm gonna prioritize visual intuition and then try and get into some of the math. Uh, and please, please ask questions whenever. Okay, first an overview of sparse distributed memory. Uh, so the fundamental question or problem is trying to solve is how can the brain write and read memories in order to retrieve the correct one later? And so there are a few considerations around this. First, we want high memory capacity. Uh, we also want robustness to query noise when we're trying to retrieve a memory later. Uh, we also, in this case, want our system to be biologically plausible. Uh, and we also want fault tolerance in that we're resistant to cell death, neuron death. Um, what makes SDM unique versus other memory models? Uh, and, and this kind of comes from its name. So it's sparse in that it works in a high dimensional vector space and neurons exist in only a fraction of possible locations in that space. Uh, secondly, it's distributed in that the read and write operations you're doing uh, apply to all nearby neurons in that vector space. So first getting into the SDM write operation, we're storing patterns in nearby neurons. So in green here, we have our first pattern. Uh, it's appearing in our high dimensional binary vector space. We'll move to continuous later, but for now we're in a binary, binary space where we're using Hamming distance. Uh, and the green pattern is going to activate neurons uh, in, in this uh, right radius around that. So the neurons are these hollow black circles um, and write itself in. And just as a side note, um, th th this pattern, it can either write itself in in an auto associative setting, or it can write in a different pattern, point to a different pattern in a hetero associative setting. So an example of that would be if I'm remembering the alphabet, then my first pattern here would be the letter A. Uh, it would write in a pointer to the letter B. And then if I query for B, it would point to C, et cetera. Uh, oh, I clicked too far. Okay, so now we've written that green pattern into nearby neurons. And so you can see that the green pattern is inside the uh, hollow black circles. And we're also keeping track of the original pattern location. And that'll be important in a second. Yep. So what space are these neurons? Is it like physical space in the brain? Uh, so I, I don't want to get too much into biological plausibility right now, but the, uh, you could think of the uh, dendrites that the neuron has uh, correspond to a vector, which represents a particular location in this high dimensional space. So the neurons all have like an address in this space. They exist in a particular location. And then uh, a pattern as it's processed by sensory stimuli kind of up the layers of the brain uh, will have some vector representation that will also define a location in this space. Is it, I have the same question. Yeah, yeah. Physically near each other. Uh, no, it's it's the the neural population code for the two vectors would be similar. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Thanks, Russell. If their addresses are similar, that means the neurons that they're synapsing from are similar. They have a high input similarity. The uh, dendrites of a neuron, so what it is sensitive to, um, what it's activated by, will be close in space. So, so the, the pattern corresponds to a population code or a particular vector, and neurons that have a high similarity to or looking for patterns like that will be close in space, and therefore they'll be activated. Um, so mathematically, these are binary vectors? Yes, high dimensional binary vectors. And when you say... Pattern is stored. 
uh, we'll, I'll get I'll get more into the math in a second. Yeah. Um, for now, you can just think of these neurons as that they have a storage vector and they're they're storing this pattern inside of it. So here we're writing in a second pattern. Uh, it has a different location in the space, uh, and it's also activating nearby neurons, and then it's writing itself in. And now note that uh, some of the neurons are storing both the green and orange patterns. Um, and you can think of this as it's storing a set of patterns, but in reality, each neuron has a one storage vector, and we're doing a summation of the patterns uh, that we're storing. And because we're in a high dimensional space, you can think of that as a superposition of the two patterns being stored uh, with minimal crosstalk between them. So finally, we're gonna write in a third pattern and you can see that it's stored again. And uh, something that's important for later is note that uh, although these patterns are ephemeral, so they've disappeared, uh, their original locations can be triangulated based upon the nearby neurons that are storing that pattern. So now we're getting into the right the read operation, and so in this case I have my pink uh, query xi, uh, and it is also going to be activating nearby neurons. Those neurons are going to output the patterns that they've stored. All of those patterns are going to be aggregated, and then we're doing a majority operation. So we'll converge towards whatever the dominant pattern uh, was. And so in this case the query is getting uh, one green, two orange, and four blue patterns, and the blue pattern dominates such that it will converge towards blue. Uh, also, that's fitting because if you look at the location of the query, it's closest to where the blue pattern was originally written in. Another way of looking at this where we abstract away the actual neurons is just consider the original pattern location. And then we can, we can just look at the intersection between the original right circle and the read circle for our query. And so in the bottom right here, I've replaced the, the number of patterns with the size of these circle intersections. And it's this circle intersection relationship here that will be crucial to mapping onto attention later. So now getting into more of the mathematical formalism, here I have my blue pattern and the intersection with the query. And I'm defining that intersection as the, num and the number of neurons in it with a cardinality operator, and then the neurons that are in the pattern intersected with the neurons that are in the query. And now I'm going to break down this equation for the read operation one step at a time. So first of all, uh, for each pattern, we're, which is denoted by the, uh, the bold P at the, on the far right, uh, we're weighting it by the size of its circle intersection. We're then summing over all of the patterns. We're then normalizing by the circle intersection weights because we ultimately want to be able to compute a majority. So we need that normalizing constant. And in this case, because we're in a binary space, we need to map back to zero or one. And so we have this majority rule function G. Okay, I'm now gonna give, and I, I'm actually not sure if I addressed your question with this because I'm, I'm focusing uh, on the high level relationship to attention. Uh, sparse distributed memory talks more about the way that the, the, the patterns are stored, but it is the superposition. So I'm doing a, a superposition all of all patterns that are stored in uh, that that activate that neuron. Yeah. Um, so does the storage move where the neuron is in the space? So it's a key value pairing. So the neuron has an address where it exists in the space, and then its storage vector that it will return. So you and you could think of that biologically as the dendrites that activate that neuron, and then the synapses it has with uh, efferent, its efferent connections downstream. Um, so this, this is the, um, the, in order to show the relationship to attention, I'm abstracting away the actual neurons. So that's, this slide doesn't show the synaptic weights, but, but there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the, actual, the neuron perspective and the pattern perspective. I just can't get into the SDM biological plausibility. I have, I have slides on it at the very end um, that hopefully we can get to, but I wanna, I wanna focus on the, the relationship to a transformer attention here. I mean, what is the background of this? Sparse memory. Yeah, so it was invented by um, uh, Kinerva. Yeah, so Kinerva, uh, he published his book on it in 1988. Uh, there were a couple extensions that were developed in a few years after, and that kind of disappeared with the sands of time. Uh, and I'm still not sure why. Maybe you have a better idea for, for why that was. Uh, 
I think they were associated, well, they, they were early associative memory, like uh, maybe you show. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so this is kind of connecting. Yes, of, yeah. and, it, and it actually, uh, I don't talk about related work here, but um, sparse distributed memory can actually uh, be written as a generalization of hot field networks. Yeah. So there is a special case. Uh, yes, there, there are still some differences, but they're, they're very closely related. So now giving a uh, short overview of transformer attention for those who are unfamiliar with it. Uh, and, and just quickly, uh, I mean, transformers are one of these state of the art deep learning models across many modalities right now. Um, and so on the left here, uh, the transformers use, being used to predict the next word um, and, and generating text. In this case, it has a, a wonderful story about unicorns uh, that you can read on OpenAI's website. Um, the attention operation is also applied in two different locations in AlphaFold 2, which was recently used for uh, protein folding prediction. Um, it's also used uh, for almost every Google English search query now. Um, and it doesn't just do uh, language processing, it's also moved into image uh, classification and generation tasks. And so uh, as a kind of fun one here, you have this model input, which is half of an image, and then it needs to predict what the other half of the image would look like. And you can see that here, it's getting the shadows correct in some different examples and the originals on the far right. Um, so the uh, core th thing that makes the transformer unique is the attention operation. Um, and I have this slide here just to show where it's, it's doing next word prediction. That's the example we're gonna be working with. And in this case, the animal didn't cross the, the street because it blank. And uh, our query to this system is the word it. And we're then looking back at the rest of the system, deciding how to pay attention to it to predict what word comes next. And so here our word it, has uh, connections with previous words that it's using to then predict what comes next. Mm -hmm. And so uh, diving more into how that works exactly, I'm gonna work with a simpler phrase, the cat sat on the blank. Uh, and there are four things that we do in order to predict the next word. And so first we take each of our input words and we create what are called keys, values, and queries. So each word aside from the last one uh, turns into both a key and a value, and then the last word becomes a query. Uh, we then use the query and compare it to each of our keys. And the way we do that is we use a dot product operation. And we then uh, take the size of those dot products with each input, and we normalize, uh, and we're using the softmax function for normalization, which is crucial to the relationship that all letters show, so I'll we'll get into that. Um, and then finally, based upon the weights, so how much attention we decide to pay to each of our inputs, which is based on how, again, how similar the query was to the keys, we're then going to take the corresponding value that's paired to each key and do a summation operation of each of those values. And then from that, we'll, we'll do some projection to then predict the next word. So as just like a fictional example, we're really gonna work through this. The cat sat on the blank. So our query word here is the, and you could hypothetically think that that query is a vector that's going to have a high dot product or be similar to uh, keys that are either nouns or their associated verbs. And so in this case, you'd think it might have a high similarity with the words cat and sat, their keys. Uh, so it gives a large weight to the cat and sat value vectors. And those, uh, the, the cat value vector, you might think of as containing some superposition of other animals that are related to cats and maybe words that rhyme, for example, the word mat. This is, this is totally fictional, but I'm just trying to give intuition, right? Uh, then the word, the, the sat value vector that corresponds to its key, we're paying attention to it, contains uh, things that are sat on, so including mat. And so uh, what you could have is when, you, when you're paying attention to both cat and sat value vectors, you're doing the summation of them, and then you, you have all of the different possible vectors in superposition and in this case, I have a weight of three on mat and then a weight of one on mouse and sofa and it, it goes on and on. But you can think that the word mat would dominate in the summation operation, uh, allowing us to then correctly predict the next word that comes. So, and I guess one piece of intuition here is what you pay attention to and what you should extract from it are different. And so that's why we have the key value pairing 
and we're paying attention to the keys and we're extracting information that are in the values. So uh, quickly, just to like show you some of the notation for this, because then we're going to map it onto SDM. Um, here I have my query that's being updated um, and it's being updated using uh, this equation. And these are the, the W's you can kind of ignore the projection matrices. Um, and so, yeah, I break this down more, more clearly here. So first we're doing a dot product between our keys and our queries. So that's shown by this operation two here. And so the, the uh, Y's are the actual inputs. We then do this projection of them. Um, and then we do a dot product. Um, then uh, we have the softmax operation. Um, and the, the way this is actually defined is an exponential over a sum of exponentials. And to give you some intuition for it, softmax normalizes the weights, but it makes large values larger. And this relationship is crucial to SDM. So that's why I'm, I'm spending a little bit of time on it. So just as this demo here, I have these inputs on my x-axis and they each have some value to them, uh, ranging from zero to five. And on the second plot here, I just do a normal normalization, in which case like that largest value, which is a, a, has an index of four, normally has a value of five. It's, if it's normalized regularly, it'll just have a value of um, 0 0.3. But if I'm using a softmax operation, mm -hmm. uh, depending on my beta coefficient in the softmax, it'll, it'll have a value of 0 0.6. So it becomes much pointier, peakier than it would if I was just doing an ordinary normalization. And uh, so ju just relating all this back to the equations again, I do my softmax operation, and then uh, I use these normalized weights to weight the summation of the value vectors we talked about before. And that gives you that full equation and hopefully some intuition for it. Okay, so how does transformer attention approximate SDM? Well, it turns out that in a high dimensional uh, space, if I have two hyperspheres, that as I pull apart those hyperspheres, the size of their circle intersection, the number of neurons that they share will decay approximately exponentially. Okay. So in this figure on the right here, uh, on the x-axis, I'm showing the hemming distance between those two circles as I pull them apart. And on the y-axis, I'm showing in log space, the number of neurons that exist in that circle intersection. And because in log space, this plot is approximately linear, it means that the number of uh, neurons in the circle intersection is approximately exponential. Uh, this is just one set of STM parameters, but I'm no using um, n equals 64 dimensions, which is the normal dimensionality used in transformer attention. Um, and do note here that the exponential approximation doesn't hold for all Hamming distances. It works best for patterns and queries that are close to each other when the circle intersection is large, but that's the regime that we care about. Um, because when we do the softmax operation and then have our normalizing constant, anything that's far, far away basically drops to zero. So here we have our equation for the circle intersection. We can write it as approximately exponential with a coefficient outside of the exponent and then the beta coefficient inside of it. Um, and there are two things that we need to do to make this relationship a good one. First, we need SDM to be continuous. And so uh, what we need there is we need a mapping from our Hamming distance into cosine similarity, where we're L2 normalizing our vectors and then taking a, their dot product. And this equation here is just the linear mapping between Hamming distance and cosine similarity. And then we also need the uh, beta coefficient inside our exponential to be a correct value that it can fit our exponential decay. And the way we can do that is in a closed form with just log linear regression on our uh, circle intersection. And so I'm gonna show you, okay, so here uh, I'm just redefining the attention operation we went through before into the uh, SDM notation, no other tricks. And this is the real money slide where it's the relationship between SDM and attention. So I've expanded out the softmax operation on the right here into the exponential over sum of exponentials. I have the, the SDM equation presented before and the extent to which the circle intersection in SDM is approximates an exponential is the extent to which SDM and attention converge. So now I just have some, some uh, results uh, first in theory. Um, and so I have two plots with different SDM settings for a small and large Hamming distance that we're using so, uh, the size of the circle radii. Um, and in blue, I have the actual circle intersection, which I'm normalizing, uh, just, just a basic normalization, right? And then uh, in orange, I am fitting an exponential with the beta coefficient using my log linear regression to the circle intersection. And then I'm, I'm using the softmax equation. 
And so you can see the quality of these approximations in these two different settings. And in the subplots, I have their, their um, log plots. And so you can see that in this case, with a larger Hamming distance, that exponential uh, eventually, it, 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 the approximation only holds for closer points. But by the time I'm at a distance, a Hamming distance of 20 here, where it drops off, you can see that my normalized weight is basically zero anyways. So uh, we've talked about the relationship between SDM and attention, but how does SDM relate to the transformer more broadly? And so one way that we can look at this is to what extent do transformers use beta coefficients in their uh, tension operation that are similar to those for optimal versions of SDM. So depending on what I want my SDM system to do, if I want to store the maximum number of memories possible um, versus if I want to have my system very robust to query noise, I will use different Hamming radii. And in order to compute this, I need to assume that my patterns are random. And so this won't apply to the real world where of course data is on some lower dimensional correlated manifold, but I can still get these values with random patterns and see how they map on for the beta coefficients that transformers decide to use. And so in this case, I'm using the key query normalized attention variant of the transformer, uh, which actually learns its beta coefficients. So it makes it very easy to look at this because uh, normal transformers don't learn their beta coefficient. You have to kind of infer what it would be from the size of its dot products between queries and patterns. Um, and so this histogram shows the learned beta coefficients across uh, attention heads, across layers for this transformer model. Uh, and the vertical red lines are three different definitions of optimal SDM. And so on the far left, uh, we're maximizing for query noise. We want our queries to be as noisy as possible, but still work. Uh, in the middle, we're maximizing so signal to noise ratio. And on the far right, we're maximizing memory capacity. And you can see that the learned beta coefficients fall within these bounds. And also it skews towards max query noise, uh, which I think makes sense because um, it, for, if you're maximizing memory capacity, you're assuming your queries are noise free. And if you're training a model in a deep learning environment without a distribution training data always appearing, of course, that's not gonna be the case. Uh, so beyond attention, how can we interpret other parts of the transformer? Well, there's some interesting work showing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this values, uh, the translation of the terms. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, SDM and, and attention use different notations, so I just needed to. The values, keys, and queries come from previous use in uh, uh, information of the three world. What was it? Yeah. Something historic. Yeah, yeah. So values are the patterns of quantities. Okay. And keys really are and, and, and again, those pattern pointers, you can be in an auto or hetero associative setting. So the pattern pointer can even either equal the address, it can point to itself. Yeah, or, uh, yeah. or exactly. Yeah. And so in a transformer setting, of course, where you're trying to predict the next thing, it would be hetero associative. Uh, associate A to B. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And um, this, this work has been accepted to NeurIPS, and the paper will be out uh, a week from today. Uh, we don't have a preprint yet, but it'll be the camera ready version is next week today. Um, so uh, there's some interesting work uh, that we cite in the paper that, where, um, that, that other people have done showing that the feed forward uh, part of the uh, attention, uh, sorry, the transformer as a whole, and, and I should have said before, this is the whole transformer architecture with each of the operations laid out. And so we can actually interpret that feed forward layer as doing a long-term uh, version of attention. And so then we can interpret it as doing a long-term version of SDM. Uh, and by long-term here, I mean, when I'm doing normal attention, um, my keys and values are a function of my uh, receptive field, the current inputs that I'm looking at. And this longer-term attention is actually uh, independent of my particular inputs that I'm working with. It'll store longer term memories across the whole uh, training, uh, multiple epochs. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And that actually relates to the neuron versus uh, pattern perspectives of SDM that I uh, talked about a while back. We can also interpret layer norm, which has been shown to be really important. People have tried to get rid of it. Uh, and this is in the sense that for, in order to do SDM, I need cosine similarity. So I need to L2 norm my vectors. And the key query normalized variant of attention that leads to some small improvements uh, actually uses L2 norm instead of layer norm. So you can kind of think of this work as uh, retroactively predicting this improvement and layer norm approximating. Yeah, so I, uh, 
basically, I look at my vector. Um, I compute for all the vectors a mean and standard deviation, and then I normalize by that. If you're familiar with the batch norm operation, it's kind of similar to that. Uh, but it's a function of, I think you have a running average of all the things you've seen. It's not just within the batch. Um, like when I do batch norm, I compute the mean of everything in that training batch. Yeah. Um, they normalize by the batch, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but they're, they're um, quite similar. And I think that they're putting everything on a similar scale the same time, the same way that L2 norm would. Uh, so beyond these connections, SDM has a number of extensions that we think could be useful in further improving the transformer. So one, SDM has some close relationships to vector symbolic architectures. Um, there's also some work showing that you could have multiple value vectors corresponding to each key. Um, there are variants of self-attention where you're not having every single input be its own query. Um, and there are other forms of external memory storage uh, techniques. And so in summary, uh, the intersection between two hyperspheres approximates an exponential. And this allows SDM's read and write operations to approximate attention uh, in theory and in the tests that we run. And so as sort of big picture future research questions that we certainly don't have answers to yet, but I'm interested in exploring, uh, are, is the transformer so successful because it's performing a key cognitive operation? And it's worth me pointing out that the cerebellum or cerebellar-like architectures are ubiquitous across a large number of organisms. Um, and so, so, so maybe there's some key operation that it's doing. Um, and given how successful the transformer has been empirically across multiple modalities, uh, is SDM the correct theory for how the cerebellum is functioning? And I think I'm pretty much out of time and want to leave time for questions, so I won't get into biological plausibility. It's in the appendix of the paper that'll be out soon. Um, but it's quite exciting in how it maps to each of the cell types. And uh, I'll just go to the thank you slide.